Brandon Burke. I am a registered respiratory therapist from Springfield, Missouri. I'm currently the Director of Clinical Education for Respiratory Therapy Program at Ozarks Technical Community College. I have a master's degree in respiratory therapy from Northeastern University in Boston, and I'd like to thank you guys for uh, watching and viewing this presentation. The authors compiled 89 different studies to complete the guideline. I would encourage you to visit the AARC's website, it's www.aarc.org, to view the guideline for itself because while this presentation is going to cover the main points of it, there are several nuanced points that you uh, need to get by reading it on your own. So the main reason why this guideline was published was to prevent unintended adverse consequences that potentially could come from suctioning. So the main things that we're going to talk about today are either creating trauma directly to the airway by tearing some of the mucosal wall or causing atelectasis from using too much vacuum regulator pressure and actually suctioning air out of the lungs causing atelectasis. So allow me to describe the mechanism that causes the actual direct airway trauma. First, the way that I was taught in school to, to suction someone is to just advance the catheter all the way down the endotracheal tube until you meet resistance and or the patient starts to cough. When you do that, you actually have bumped into the carina, so you're, you're having the catheter actually touch the, the tracheal tissue. Then you withdraw the catheter a couple of centimeters and then apply suction and withdraw that catheter slowly and remove it. Part of the problem with that is, is that it actually potentially causes that airway trauma. So when you advance the catheter all the way down until you meet, that, meet the resistance, you're actually bumping into that carina, into the tracheal tissue. Then when you apply the suction pressure, it can actually adhere to that tracheal wall. When you apply the suction and remove the catheter, it will actually cause a disruption or tear into that tissue. And when that happens, it can cause bleeding in the inflammatory process to take place into that, into that area. And a lot of patients that are in, in the hospital on mechanical ventilators in the ICU already are susceptible to infection and they're at risk of developing complications that will increase their length of stay, that will increase their chance of morbidity and mortality. So whenever we are actually doing that, we are increasing that, those risks, so we should try to avoid those if at all possible. So besides the airway trauma, another common problem is we can actually cause the patient to develop atelectasis. And any time that we go down to suction, we're using negative pressure. So relative to the atmosphere, we're actually sucking air out of the patient's lungs. So whenever we advance the catheter, apply suction, we're actually removing some of the air from the lungs, which causes the airway to potentially collapse, or in the medical field we call that atelectasis. So when we do that, we have to be very, very careful to not cause atelectasis as, as well as the tissue tearing. So now that we've discussed the two potential negative consequences that can occur from suctioning, let's talk about ways that we can combat those. So the first thing I want to discuss, and maybe the most important thing, is that there needs to be an actual indication to suction someone. There needs to be evidence of secretions being present in the airway. So respiratory therapists, nurses, are all, uh, we've all been guilty of doing this in the past where we have, a, we have a patient that might be coughing or we might uh, think they need to be suctioned or every time we go in there we think, oh, this patient's really ill on the ventilator, so we need to suction them. And really the evidence doesn't support that. We shouldn't routinely suction people uh, just because they have an endotracheal tube in place and they're on a mechanical ventilator. We really should have a, a positive indication that they have secretions present. And a few of those are, namely, if you can see secretions in the airway. So if they cough and you actually see those secretions go up into the tube, then obviously that's an indication to suction. The second one would be, you know, if you, if you listen to them with your stethoscope, you put your stethoscope on their chest, and you hear uh, what we call ronchi or coarse crackles where it almost sounds like a snoring sound, then that's an indication they have secretions in the upper airway as well. The other one is uh, maybe the physician is requiring a sputum sample that, to send to the lab for culture and sensitivity so we can see um, if they have uh, anything growing that we, and what antibiotics that they need. So we would try to attempt to go down and suction them for that. And the other one might be that you can actually feel it. You can actually feel it with your hands, hear it, without the aid of a stethoscope sometimes. Um, and also on the ventilator graphics, you can see that the, the flow scalars are kind of choppy. And all of those are indications to suction. And if you don't have those, then we should not suction them on a routine basis. So the next thing we want to discuss is proper depth to insert the catheter. As I discussed previously, the way that a lot of us were taught was to advance it until we met resistance or the patient coughed. But again, there are several problems with that. And I want to demonstrate for you here uh, this is a standard endotracheal tube, it's a 7.0 that we would use on a lot of uh, adult patients. And this is just a standard inline suction catheter, it's a 14 French catheter. And I want to demonstrate for you a couple things. One is, if you insert this catheter all the way in, as far as it will go, it goes out 
several centimeters past the end of the endotracheal tube. And when endotracheal tubes are positioned correctly, they should be two to three centimeters above the level of the carina. And as you can see here, this catheter is significantly longer than that. So whenever, if, if you insert this all the way like I have it here, what will happen is it will either go down into the right main stem bronchus, or it will actually bump into the carina and curl over on itself, potentially kind of tying itself in a knot. And then, as we discussed previously, when you apply the suction pressure by depressing the button, it will actually adhere to the wall of the trachea, and when you remove it, it will actually tear that tissue away, causing bleeding, okay? So we want to avoid that if at all possible. So the way that you avoid it is, if you can see here, an endotracheal tube has centimeter markings on it, and a suction catheter has centimeter markings on it as well. And you can see those there. And what you want to do is you want to line those up because all they are is measuring the, the length of, of the respective tubes. So as you insert this catheter, you need to twist it around to where you can line the numbers up here. And I'm just going to line up the 25 with a 25. And you can see when you do that, the tube, the, the catheter is just at the end of the endotracheal tube. That way then when you apply suction and withdraw it, you're ensuring that you're not coming into contact with any tracheal tissue whatsoever. So to quote the clinical practice guideline, they suggest to use shallow suctioning rather than deep suctioning when we, when we perform an endotracheal or tracheal suctioning. And the reason for that is based on neonatal and pediatric studies. They've been doing that for years. And I will tell you, just from a physiology and anatomy standpoint, the tissue from a neonate or a pediatric patient in their trachea is the exact same as it is for adult. So we shouldn't have two standards of care. We should, al we should always suction using shallow suction technique to make sure that we are preventing that airway trauma from occurring, which can potentially lead to detrimental uh, effects. So another important point is to consider the catheter size that you're using for the size of endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube that you have in place in the patient. So the general guidelines should be that we use a catheter that occludes less than 50% of the inner lumen of the endotracheal tube. A good guideline to follow on that is to, to take the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube and multiply it by two, and then use the next smallest size catheter. So for example, if I had a patient that was intubated with a 7.5 inner diameter endotracheal tube, I would multiply that by two, so that would be 15, and then I would use the next smallest size, so a 14 French catheter would be acceptable for a 7.5 tube. But as you go smaller down in tube size, for example, if I had a, seven point, a patient intubated with a 7.0 endotracheal tube, a 14 French catheter would be too large in diameter, so I would need to use the next smallest size, which is a 12 French. And just a note, uh, suction catheter sizes in French go up by two, so you would use 14 French, 12 French, 10 French, and so on uh, as you go down the line. But for an adult, we should always, always remember to use a catheter that is less than 50% of the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube. So as you can see from the table, there are recommendations for endotracheal tube size and suction catheter size that would correspond with that. So you can see for a 7.5 tube and up, a 14 French catheter is acceptable. Uh, however, as you go to a 7 or a 6.5, a 12 French would be appropriate. And for a 6 or a 5 and a half tube, a 10 French catheter would be appropriate. I hope that you find this information useful in your own practice. Please contact me anytime with any questions you might have. I'd be happy to hear from you. Thanks.